I see the doors are closed. That's my cue, I heard. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to, and I have to verify, but Jos might know, this is the sixth edition of the Missing Link. Can we call it a symposium? I think we can call it a symposium. Um, so the sixth uh, Missing Link uh, symposium, in previous ones, uh, there was focus on topics such as the growing role of women in video games. I think uh, uh, trolling behavior in League of Legends was discussed. Uh, legal issues facing the uh, esports industry. And most recently, I think uh, um, uh, we talked about the transition from offline to online uh, during COVID times uh, and the influence that that all had on us. Um, but very welcome, uh, a warm welcome to you all to this edition uh, in which we will talk about the um, uh, process of character creation. Um, and uh, to that end, we have invited, uh, well, we actually invited three speakers, but I'm already going to. I decided to rip that bandage off quickly. We've only got two speakers um, because, unfortunately, Nathan Wildman uh, has fallen ill. I see. Yes. Yes. But I'm sure that these other two speakers that are on your ticket, they're also going to blow your mind. Um, don't worry about it. But we are as dis uh, well uh, disappointed, I wouldn't say, but we, uh, it's very unfortunate that Nathan uh, couldn't make it today. He has unfortunately fallen ill, um, but I'm sure that uh, you will see him sometime around campus here uh, again because he is uh, a philosopher here at the um, Department of Philosophy at Tilburg University. Um, but we have two uh, wonderful speakers. Uh, first up, in a bit, we have uh, Aris uh, Emanuel Ludis, who is the head of the uh, Game and Art Design uh, Department at the SAE Institute in Amsterdam which is an institute that offers, uh, well, you can talk about that yourself a bit, but what I uh, read on their website is that they um, uh, offer fully-fledged undergraduate courses in uh, game and art design. Um, so if you're very interested uh, in that, please talk to Aris uh, afterwards. And um, he is going to take us through the entire process of character creation, actually from its conception of a game character to its implementation in the actual game. Um, after his speech, we'll have time for a few questions. Uh, then we'll have a short break of, I think, 10 minutes, maybe, something like that. Um, 10 minutes, um, after which we'll reconvene here and we'll continue with uh, Rudolf's uh, talk. Um, and uh, he is the narrative producer at Wolfpack Game Studios. Uh, you can talk more about that yourself, what that exactly entails, but you have a lot of experience when it comes to VR games and strategy games. And I also heard you talking about escape rooms. Um, and you will tell us more about the, well, you will show us some good examples, bad examples of game characters. Uh, and he promised us a very interactive talk. So please prepare, like already think ahead. Wh what are your favorite characters? What makes them good in your eyes? Um, so uh, after that, we'll have uh, a panel discussion um, uh, after Rudolf's uh, contribution. Uh, both speakers will join me here on stage and there will be more than enough time for you to ask all the questions that you have. Um, very shortly about me, my name is uh, Ruben Bastiaanse. I'm an alumnus of uh, uh, Tilburg University. Now I am a part-time teacher at the uh, Fontes University of Applied Sciences. I teach journalism studies and ethics of journalism. Um, but far more importantly for the purposes of tonight is that I'm also a little bit of a part-time gamer myself. I'm not that good, I actually suck. Um, but uh, tonight, and I also discussed this with Rudolf, I'll be transforming into my imaginary counter ego uh, in a game of D&D. He's called Many a Duck Stumbletoe. He's a very drunk uh, monk, and he's a halfling, and he has some obvious character flaws. Um, just goes to say, I just want to make the point across that I'm also very interested in what I can learn from these talks of these, uh, of these two speakers. Um, all jokes aside, I think uh, we best uh, get this party on the, on the road. So, Aris, I would like to invite you to come to the stage. Please give him a big hand. Is this on? Yeah, perfect. Um, thank you, Ruben. Uh, thank you, uh, Link, for inviting me here. Uh, it's really nice to be here with you today and also really nice to see so many people interested in video game characters. Um, as uh, Ruben said, I am the uh, program coordinator and head of the uh, game art and animation uh, department at uh, SAE Institute in Amsterdam. And I have, um, have also completed my uh, PhD on uh, uh, cultural analysis at the University of Amsterdam. And the uh, focus of my research 
is uh, online video game communities. So, uh, today uh, we will examine the two ways that uh, shape and define video game characters. Um, we'll go uh, first in the first part, because uh, this is a little bit of a hybrid uh, uh, focus on this presentation. We'll go a little bit uh, on the technical stuff, uh, for which, uh, because I come from a cultural analysis and more theoretical background, I asked uh, the help of my colleague, Dennis Burtzma, uh, to whom I'm uh, grateful. And uh, uh, then uh, we will also look how uh, characters are being uh, shaped by um, culture, the culture around them. So, uh, first, uh, and I took this uh, screenshot from uh, the Logos uh, YouTube uh, channel because it's always important to uh, reference your sources. Um, uh, the word character uh, has uh, Greek roots. Uh, it was a little bit easy for me to understand because uh, I am Greek, but uh, to explain it to you uh, as well, character uh, comes from the word uh, charakter, uh, which means mark engraved, and the verb haraso or harato, which means to engrave. Uh, this engraving, in uh, terms of video game characters, uh, can occur in two ways. One, by the designers themselves, as I said earlier, and two, by culture. Maybe there are more subpaths, but uh, today we're going to look at uh, these two main ones. So, first, what we need when we set to uh, design a character? We need a game Bible. Uh, game Bible doesn't really have to be a paper uh, document. It could also be a, a digital document, but there uh, we write everything about uh, 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 the game. So we first have to uh, conceive uh, the character, we have to conceive the setting, uh, the plot of the game, pretty much everything. Uh, background, powers, motives, everything that define the character. Um, uh, of course, uh, you will hear more about it uh, later, but uh, it's uh, something very important when it comes to uh, designing a character. Then comes the stage of concept art. Uh, we draw and uh, there is usually a large team of uh, designers uh, and uh, artists who uh, draw various uh, ways of how they envision that character, always staying true to what the uh, designers and the producers have uh, asked them to include. Uh, what is also important to note here is that a uh, lot of concept art remains unused. Uh, so sometimes when you go to the games, uh, video games extra uh, 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 menu, you can see uh, concept art or sometimes the companies uh, ask you to pay a little extra to get access to that content, uh, concept art. But uh, what I'm uh, trying to uh, distinguish here is that uh, concept art is different than promo art uh, because uh, promo art comes after the character is finished and is used for promotional reasons. And it's also possible that the promo art you see is not included in the game, but uh, it's not concept art, it's a different thing. Uh, at this point, uh, after the character is uh, designed, uh, it's finished in the concept art level, we have to transfer, uh, we can scan uh, the document or start anew through uh, some software and uh, we transfer it uh, to uh, our software and then comes the part of meshing, which is actually our character becomes a block out. Uh, at this point, we also have to think of animation and uh, what will this mean? for the character, so how will our character move? Uh, because we will have to animate the character later. Um, this is of course uh, required for a 3D character. For a 2D character, uh, uh, a 2D character comes to life uh, uh, by also different types of software, but the concept art uh, phase is equally important and then uh, the transfer and uh, the implementation uh, on uh, software. Um, then it's uh, the sculpturing uh, phase. So we can start with a low uh, polygon sculpture or a high polygon uh, sculpture. And uh, we load the base, uh, the mesh that we created on the software. Uh, Zebras is a standard uh, software, uh, the, um, the one that is used mainly in the industry. It's uh, one that many uh, artists know how to operate and use and also lots of uh, companies ask for uh, zebra knowledge, zebras knowledge, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and uh, here we can uh, also add more polygons, add more details and uh, start giving a bit more uh, realistic. We'll, we will talk about realism a bit later uh, to our character. Then uh, comes texturing. Uh, we color our character. Uh, we can use Photoshop or Substance uh, and uh, there are some other uh, software as well, free or not free, but 
Yeah, usually it's the more expensive one that uh, <coughs> companies ask for. Uh, we animate the character, uh, and then uh, the character is ready to be imported to an engine, such as Unreal or Unity, and uh, be part of a larger game. Um, there are two other techniques that uh, give uh, life to a character here, and uh, one of them is still in use. The other one is becoming more and more obsolete, but is already obsolete. So first, uh, there is uh, mockup, which is um, abbreviation of motion capture. People wear this uh, shoot. They perform moves, and then these moves are being uh, um, implemented in the game. And uh, then uh, <laughs> there used to be this other um, process, which I'm very fond of, but I don't really see anymore in games. I wonder why. Uh, digitization. Uh, this is from uh, Gabriel Knight. So uh, what they used to do uh, back then, the studios, they would hire uh, actors. Uh, these actors would uh, perform the moves of the character and uh, uh, then uh, they would be captured through a video camera and transferred uh, on a computer and then this would be uh, implemented in the game. We see Gabriel Knight here and one of my favorite examples, we see uh, Mortal Kombat. So uh, in that uh, particular case, they also needed uh, costume designers uh, in order to capture the aesthetics of an ancient uh, fighting tournament. So. If you are doing it through digitization, you also need to think of the costume designers. Uh, but yeah, who can find that helmet? Um, so, one thing we should also note is that, uh, and always keep in mind, that uh, character design is uh, a part of a larger group. I said earlier, but I cannot stress this enough. Uh, working at the same time and also having long meetings. Uh, and um, usually, I mean, it depends on the project and the budget. Sometimes it's a small group of artists or even one artist if it's an indie production, but uh, usually it's uh, an art supervisor who's in charge. I got these pictures from uh, the Guerrilla Games uh, website, by the way, and uh, yeah, Guerrilla is based in the Netherlands, so we are supporting the local product. Um, of course, if you uh, want to improve your um, skills and learn more, there's a number of uh, online communities and forums, sometimes they are official, uh, like yeah, Unity has its own uh, community. Uh, there are also uh, um, servers on Discord in which um, artists can get together and exchange ideas and uh, find more um, projects to work on and create a community. Is that simple? Uh, is it that simple? What about the process behind all that? Because, yeah. We have a character, we design the character, but is it just this phase? There is way more than that. So, uh, this is an example from Street Fighter II, uh, which uh, features a very colorful cast of uh, international characters. Actually, the, um, uh, uh, the subtitle of the game was uh, The World Warrior, Street Fighter II, The World Warrior. So this is uh, the basic cast of the eight world warriors uh, that were included in the first version of the game. And uh, some of you might be familiar with it, but uh, I want you to uh, take a moment and think and let me know if you can distinguish which character is uh, the American, the American fighter. Can anyone guess? Yes? Yeah, Gaia. I mean, you can see the flag on his, uh, the American flag on his elbow. And of course, Ken is also American, but uh, Ken is a little uh, different story. Then we have, well, Honda, which is obviously Japanese uh, and uh, is dressed as a sumo wrestler featuring Kabuki theater um, face paint. Um, Zangief, the Russian. But I want to uh, take a moment and talk a little bit about the character on uh, the bottom Right, that you can that you see. Uh, the reason I picked this is because fighting games are excellent cases, uh, and uh, they feature diverse uh, casts with multiple stereotypes sometimes, uh, or even exaggerated. But let's talk about Dalsim now. So, this is Dalsim. Uh, you can guess in a way that he's uh, from India because, well, his attire uh, is as the designers at least perceived an Indian fighter. He has uh, exotic face paint, earrings, bracelets. Um, 
good point, good point. And his fighting style is listed as yoga. So while everybody goes uh, uh, to participate in a fighting tournament, uh, being trained in some uh, dangerous and deadly martial art, Dalsim goes there as a yoga fighter. Also, he has an elephant. He also throws flame, which is not really part of yoga. It's more closely associated with uh, the street performers and the so-called fakirs. Um, but for some reason, the designers thought that an Indian character should know yoga and throw flames. And uh, he's also a little bit of a magician because he can teleport. And uh, this is something that has also been uh, depicted in other uh, Indian characters, uh, such as uh, the great tiger in Punch Out, who uses magic to participate in boxing fights and he teleports around the ring or creates uh, duplicates of himself. So to some designers, an Indian fighter should fulfill those criteria, should wear this kind of uh, exotic attire, practice yoga, ride elephants, throw flames, and have magical powers. What does that teach us, though? Is this a realistic uh, representation? Well, in a way, yeah, and I will explain what I mean. So, uh, here is a screenshot from uh, Forza, the uh, racing game, and we see that it's, well, quite really detailed, it looks very real, and uh, yes, it could be uh, perceived as realistic. Um, the car picture can be realistic, but then if I add an explosion there, or if I add a UFO uh, invading the city, it will still look realistic because of uh, the design being made in a way to look it like it's, it's, it's real. But realism also means that uh, what is real is not restricted on appearance, but also perception. So realism does not reproduce reality, as John Fisk said, but also makes sense of it. So this is um, John Marston from Red Dead Redemption. And uh, one could argue that he's a realistic character because he, has, he's, uh, he lived during the Wild West uh, period, he has a beard, holds a gun, wears a hat, the American flag, so he's uh, exactly as uh, designers and gamers and the culture around it would understand an American cowboy, not in the American flag, which was also uh, uh, prevalent in Guile that I showed earlier that had the American flag tattoo on it, so on him. So um, he might look less realistic than the car to the, right, to the left, but at least in the minds of people, he is realistic because he uh, carries all those stereotypes that have been assigned to uh, characters of that uh, period and um, uh, area. So realism is not only what looks like it exists in this world, but it also uh, reproduces what is understood as dominant. Now, uh, talking about realism and uh, characters, um, I quote uh, Florence Maldonado, who in his turn uh, featured this interview by John Diaz, a, a game character uh, designer. Um, so there is this default uh, tier, uh, which is uh, a very uh, <laughs> highly repetitive um, character um, design, a character um, trait, uh, the straight male white gunslinger. So uh, this is Chris Redfield from uh, Resident Evil. And uh, Diaz pretty much argues that if you remove this character and replace him with any other male white straight gunslinger, you could pretty much have the same game. Uh, yeah, if you remove him and put, I don't know, Duke nu Nukem in his uh, place, maybe not much will change in the game. But um, it's a good thing that we now have a bit more of a change in uh, video games uh, and the culture. So we see more representation from uh, characters such as Aloy 
and Miles Morales in Spider-Man, so oh, yeah. So we have the default tier, but uh, we should keep in mind that there is a wave of different characters coming in and this is a really welcome change. Um, now, it's also important to know that when it comes to designing characters, the fans themselves can have an, uh, an input and uh, this can be uh, evident in uh, games that feature uh, character creation and there you can pretty much create your own character as you want or realistic <laughs> as you want and um, video games implement this more and more and uh, they all pretty much allow for some smaller or bigger uh, changes and uh, edits on video game characters. Now, I want to, uh, moving on, I want to move to another uh, path of uh, video game uh, character uh, design. And uh, this is more uh, focusing on fandom, which is uh, my favorite field. And I want to take you back to 1992. Again, uh, we go to, uh, we stick with uh, fighting games, because as I said, it's a very interesting genre when it comes to character uh, representation and um, character design. And uh, we, have to, we will look at Mortal Kombat, the original Mortal Kombat, which was released in 1992, as I said. Um, it featured two ninjas, Sub-Zero and Scorpion. But uh, it also featured this uh, menu when uh, the operator of uh, the arcade game, because it, fir it first uh, was released as an arcade, when the arcade operator would uh, turn it on, uh, they could access this uh, menu, which featured uh, this little uh, setting there called Air Max, which is a shortened uh, um, version of Error Macro, and it was just put there for the machine to capture various errors in the game. But when uh, fans saw that, they thought that uh, Air Max, because Air Max was placed underneath reptile appearances and reptile battles, and reptile was a secret character in the game, they thought that, hey, there might be another secret character, Ermax. So uh, they started writing letters uh, to uh, magazines. Yeah, video game magazines used to be a thing, and now not anymore, unfortunately. But uh, uh, they uh, were sending messages uh, uh, asking about Ermax, and then there was some Tony Cassie who claimed he managed to meet Ermax and also sent a picture which was probably edited because Ermac did not exist. There was not a character named Ermac in the game. But someone claimed they found Ermac and it was, uh, he looked like a red ninja. So it's also most likely that maybe it was, it was a glitch because as I, as I said earlier, there were like two uh, ninjas in the game, a blue ninja and a yellow ninja. So maybe it was a glitch. Maybe his uh, TV screen had some settings different, but Ermac did not exist. There was no Ermac in the game. However, uh, Midway, uh, the company uh, that released the game took notice of all these um, discourse around Ermac, and then in uh, Mortal Kombat 2, uh, they included some uh, hints about uh, Ermac, like uh, here is a character, another ninja, <laughs> by the way, who shows up and says, Ermac who? And then disappears. So that added even more fuel to the fire. And uh, then uh, we reached 1994, uh, five, in Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, and Ermac became a reality, and Ermac was a red ninja, exactly as uh, fans rumored uh, uh, circulated all those rumors uh, uh, about his appearance. Um, but what I find really, really interesting is that Ermac uh, continued existing in the Mortal Kombat universe and when Mortal Kombat uh, 9 was released in 2011, uh, he was given this tagline, we are many, you are but one, because uh, according to the game's lore, Ermac is a character, is a, is a being created by the fusion of thousands of souls uh, put together to create one very powerful being. So he has the power of the thousands of the fans that asked for him and he was manifested as one powerful being. So we are many, you are but one means that he has the power of the thousands of fans supporting and backing him. And that was also uh, uh, played uh, a couple of years later when Mortal Kombat 11 was released and a very popular character, Melina, was added to the roster while being initially absent. And uh, in one of her pre-battle intros, uh, someone asked her, hey, I thought you were dead. And Melina responds, uh, a million of souls were asking for my return. So, yeah. 
companies uh, sometimes like this little hint and like doing this kind of uh, marketing research by uh, taking, uh, uh, taking notice of fans' requests to save characters. But we should always be uh, uh, cautious of exploitation because sometimes companies might overdo it a little bit also because we live in a capitalist world. So um, companies really, uh, like not, not all of them, but it's also becoming a prevalent thing, um, asking fans to pretty much create characters or settings or items or um, artifacts of the game for free and uh, then uh, borrow them and put them in the game. And I remember when Fallout 3 was announced, uh, Bethesda uh, also announced that they're opening a forum in which uh, fans can um, submit ideas for the game and uh, submit ideas for items and, and environments and other things for the game. And uh, the best ones will be implemented and they will all help them create the game together. And some fans were a bit hesitant because they understood this as free labor. But uh, most of the fans, surprisingly, were uh, quick to disregard those comments and just say, no, no, it's our opportunity to finally get the game we wanted. I don't know if they did, but this is uh, the tactic that Bethesda employed. Um, to uh, sum things up, uh, a character yeah, comes from a designer or a group of uh, designers and artists that work together and uh, in a way can shape opinions because they throw a character out in a uh, social context. A character is not just an artifact that exists on a void. Uh, but a character can also be part of a culture and uh, in the end can also be appropriated by fans themselves and the fans can uh, give additional properties to the character and uh, in a way uh, push a company towards a change or not. And uh, I know some of you here are um, parts of uh, and other esports competitors and they participate in competitions so you're very familiar, I suppose, with Waluigi and Smash. In case you're not, I will explain that Waluigi is a character from the Mario franchise who uh, in the games themselves, the Mario games, he's a secondary or even tertiary character. He doesn't really have an important role. But for some reason, he's extremely popular with the Super Smash Brothers community and uh, there are all those petitions online for him to be uh, included in the Smash, Super Smash games. He hasn't been included, but uh, yeah, fans still create uh, memes about him and still ask for Waluigi to be implemented in the game. So far he hasn't been, and I don't know if he will, but I decided to uh, finish my presentation with uh, Waluigi exactly to give you this example that c companies use software and use teams to uh, design characters, but it's also the social context around the characters that shapes them. I thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Aris? Do we? Can, can everybody hear him, or would it be? I'll just use. What is your main source for inspiration for characters? My personal store uh, inspiration. So. Um, I personally do not make uh, characters. I'm not a game designer myself. I am uh, part of a school who does, though. But uh, in my uh, contact with students and uh, when I uh, discuss their assignments with them, I always try to uh, let them uh, go their way and uh, implement you know, when it comes to designing characters or creatures or environments to always use their own um, let's say, um, experiences and always, uh, because sometimes it's difficult to come up with an original <laughs> idea. So, and I believe that even if an idea is original, still there's a little trait of you in it. So uh, yeah, my, uh, my advice, and if I ever want to design my own character would be to always go back to my own experiences, to my own uh, worries, my concerns, my uh, proudest moments and uh, look for inspiration uh, first in me and then in around me. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, I was wondering maybe, like, uh, yeah. uh, does the, 
process of character creation, which you of, uh, often see in games, does that always add to these characters that eventually roll out of them being more realistic or uh, versus, I would say, pre-made characters? Do you understand what I... Uh, can you elaborate? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, you have games where you, for example, just get jumped, uh, get pushed into a story and you have like a set protagonist and you are playing this protagonist and he has all these character uh, traits yeah. and you can't really have any influence on them. Um, but you also have games which allow you to create your own, b maybe yeah. basically outsourcing it to the public. Yeah. Um, uh, which of the two do you think is more realistic in terms? Because, hmm. uh, yeah. Um, both of them, in a way, uh, can be realistic because, uh, well, yeah, uh, games uh, sometimes give you with a set character and you cannot really influence a lot of it. Um, so, um, yeah. That uh, could be the easy answer. But uh, I also uh, believe a lot in the power of fan fiction and uh, user-generated content. So it's very common for uh, fans who might not specifically like or want to give their own take of a character, they want to give their own version of a story or an event, uh, to create their own content either by, well, animate, be designing a character uh, themselves or by creating art or creating fan fiction or creating their own videos, mashups, and in a way alternate the story and give their own take. So, um, yes, I think it comes from both ways. That's another question. Uh, you were talking about <coughs> uh, stereotypes in video games, but mm -hmm. like I assume there is, there has to be some level of um, kind of stereotyping in the character so that you can show the char character's culture, especially in like fighting games, so you know kind of the story of that character with just their fist. How do you decide on the right level of uh, stereotype in the character itself? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if there is a right level of stereotype. And uh, yeah, the truth is that the word stereotype is uh, has more of a negative connotation, which is not bad. Uh, it's actually a good thing to take into consideration uh, that uh, sometimes you might uh, offend a group of people. Uh, Nothing against that. It is actually more. Uh, it adds to the thought process. Um, so yeah, I would say that uh, it's not bad to uh, have a character who represents a culture, and people can find it very empowering. But when it comes, uh, when it becomes problematic, is when this character might uh, turn in, might be slowly turning into a caricature. So uh, the character I showed earlier, uh, Dalsim, to be honest, I don't know how he has been uh, received in uh, the Indian community of gamers, but I know that uh, some uh, mainly Western gamers see him as a caricature because one of his uh, super moves is that he can stretch his limbs really, really, really uh, far because of his yoga expertise. So uh, I think that for some people this could be uh, perceived as a caricature. So I think that when you... It's, as I said, it's not bad to include some representation. Representation is empowering. But uh, when uh, yeah, you get the feeling that you're crossing a, a limit, then maybe it's time to you know, take a step back and think. Do you consider, because uh, um, I, I think that a game, for example, with the stereotypes we just saw in a game such as like Street Fighter, I think, uh, or Mortal Kombat, I think that would have more backlash in this day and age. Uh, I don't know if you agree, but uh, there, there are some obvious stereotypes in there. Um, <laughs> is, is there, is there uh, do you think is the, uh, the process of creating characters, has, has that become more difficult now that stereotyping is more frowned upon, in your opinion? Short question, uh, short answer, yes. <laughs> uh, but um, as I said earlier, it's something that, and now it's a good thing that they work with uh, larger groups and more people uh, participate in the th thought process. So it's, it's a good thing that they can also take this uh, into consideration. Also, um, I wouldn't say it's always that difficult to uh, notice those things because there are like big studios backing uh, those AAA projects and there are sponsors behind. So there is an entire uh, process of uh, marketing as well. Uh, there are, there's not just one team. I, I explained how one team of artists can sit down and design a character, but when it comes to uh, creating the plot, and when it comes to marketing the game, and when it comes to designing other elements of the game, this is part of a much, much larger process. And uh, there are so many teams uh, behind it. So I think the fact that there are more and more people working on it, and also people from different backgrounds, 
then uh, yeah, this could uh, prevent um, mishaps. All right. Yep. Yeah. So a diverse team is a, is an opportunity. It is. The thing is that I don't know how diverse the uh, <laughs> gaming uh, industry is at the moment because, yes, we hear a lot about it, but let's not forget that uh, a few months ago, so in, in summer, there was all, all those allegations of sexual misconduct or uh, uh, racist uh, um, um, commentary in uh, Activision Blizzard, for example, and in other companies. So I think it's something that is promised and something we hear about, but still we are a long uh, way from that. Sure. All right. Uh, there's a yeah. question in the. Uh, let's take two more questions, and then yeah. we'll uh, go on to the next speaker. Um, since your expertise in also in online community, in the game community, and like mm -hmm. fan fandom, don't you think there's also a negative aspect that the fandom gets too involved in what they want and what they want to see? For example, a thing that I thought of was with the release of The Last of Us Two. I remember that the character Abby, that her voice actress Laura Bailey, actually got death threats from people online because yeah. they didn't like what the well, character did in the game. I think we will hear about The Last of Us in the next presentation, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's something that is there, yes. Uh, toxicity is a thing. And I can think of a, a bigger example than uh, Gamergate, uh, which was this uh, scandal, uh, that uh, this movement, as the, its participants uh, uh, named it, that uh, started from fans in order to cleanse the video game journalism field. And in a way, they just went around th threatening uh, women who work in the industry and uh, women journalists because they thought that they should not be part of their culture and that they are biased or, um, yeah. And they even uh, uh, came to the part of uh, forcing uh, video game designer uh, Zoe Quinn to relocate uh, due to death threats. So, um, yes. Toxic, uh, toxicity exists, gaming uh, cultures are toxic, they're not balanced, and as I said earlier, we still have a lot of work to do. All right. I'm uh, actually very happy that Luke asked that previous question, because uh, that is a perfect segue for my question. Uh, I don't know if it's been a very widespread thing, but I know that um, with the release of Horizon Forbidden West, they actually uh, aged Aloy a bit more and made her gain some weight, you mm -hmm. know, because it's supposed to be a couple yep. years in the future and whatnot but there was lots of fan backlash for apparently quote unquote ruining the character, misrepresenting what she stands for, et cetera, et cetera. To what extent do you think that you know a gaming community and said toxic gaming community can actually keep the lid on general open-mindedness surrounding character designing in the future, if you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 uh, I get it. Well, I think to, uh, yeah, a, <laughs> a community sometimes is as uh, powerful as its uh, wallet. So, uh, yeah, if a company sees that this might also affect their um, marketing, they might, uh, yeah, implement some changes, or as I said earlier, there were uh, constant uh, requests of Melina in Mortal Kombat, and then they decided to create Melina, and of course, she was not added for free to the game, people had to pay and download her. So, um, also to give a, a, a short answer, Companies do listen, but uh, let's not forget that uh, companies are enterprises, they are uh, profit driven. So um, yeah, they first and foremost want to uh, make money and also all those changes that uh, uh, we were, were talking about and all those additions, they uh, cost money to be made. There's, there has to be a team that will sit down and work for hours, days, months on those um, changes and implementations. So yes. Um, in, in, in the end, is uh, uh, profit always being taken into consideration? All right, I think we yeah. will leave it at that, but there will be more than enough time yeah. afterwards uh, to uh, ask Iris some more questions. Please give him a, another big hand. <laughs> I would like to give the floor to, uh, to Rudolf, who is uh, going to talk to us about good examples, bad examples, your examples of video game characters. So please give him a big hand. Everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to have an interactive talk today, uh, so I hope that all of you are awake enough. I know it's dark, I know it's in the afternoon, I know we want to be in the sunshine. Take half an hour of your time. I hope this will be interesting. It's probably going to be interesting. So, um, uh, I'm Rudolf. I am a game writer and narrative designer. I've been doing this since 2011. 
Um, I've worked on a variety of projects. I have some experience. I hope that will come across today. And um, in my profession, but I guess generally everybody gets this occasionally, where people will walk up to you or you're at a meeting, in a creative meeting usually, and they go like, oh, have you played this game? Have you played this particular game? And my answer 80% of the time is no. <laughs> to be honest, I don't have that much time playing games. I'm, I'm usually working. Um, but the answer is usually no. And then people will go on a complete like inspired rant. And literally, I have this every other day. I'm not joking. Just now, I came off the train. Somebody saw me. It's like, oh, you're wearing a kilt. And they're like, have you seen the series Angel Share? And I'm like, who are you? <laughs> But for them, that was a great opportunity to go like, oh, Angel Share, it's this blah, Scottish, blah, blah, something they get, exclusive whiskey. And I literally get this every time. So I just want to like share the pain with you guys for a moment. And I, I'm going to single somebody out over here. We're only having eye contact. Hello there. My name is Rudolph. Excuse me, what's, what's your name? Helen. Hey, Helen. Um, have you played God of War, like the, the, the new one on PS4, PS5? So you have played it. All right. What do you think of it so far? Okay, so what's that? The, the characters, the story, is that it's the gameplay part? What do you like about it? I mean, I'm not really into that game, like that kind of game, I guess. Okay, and I'm assuming that's just like the action part, or is it because of the character representation of some? No, I, I don't think it's that special to me. Okay, all right. Anyway, th that's what games, right? But some, some, some hit, some don't. So I'm not going to pick somebody else who was unfortunate. I see the one sitting on this side, looking away. Thank you so much. Yes, you're still <laughs> looking away. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rudolph. What's, what's your name? Hi. Excuse me, what was your name? Emil. Emil. Hey, man. Um, so, have you played League of Legends? Um, I joined it, but uh, I stopped. Good, okay. Good man. <laughs> <laughs> did, wh who did you main? Which character did you did you play there? Uh, I think it's this guy with the long hair. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he was cool. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry, yes. Uh, I didn't get the character name, but you played a character with a sword in League of Legends. Yes, yes. Oh, are we getting a microphone out there? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, All right, uh, this is gonna be double up here. Could you just repeat yourself? Yeah, you so I played uh, <laughs> League of Legends for a bit. I played a character that used a sword, and yeah, he looks cool. All right, excellent, very much. And I'm gonna single somebody else out, this guy over here at the front. Dude, um, have you played The Last of Us, part one? Have I played The Last of Us? No. No, no, you should definitely play it. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen my, I've seen my it's friend play it, uh -huh. but at the time I was kind of like rebelling against the whole like zombie thing appearing everywhere. Too many zombie games, too many zombie cities. I was like, no. I, uh, I feel you in that regard. We definitely have to play that game. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do a following thing here. Um, uh, uh, hands or noise, whatever you prefer. Uh, everybody. Who here has played The Last of Us Part 1? Did we pass an entire Let's Play of watching this? I said played. I <laughs> Whatever, man, join in. Join in on the fun. Join in on the fun. All right, who's, who's played it? Yeah? All right, what did you think? General, good, bad, just blah, 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 blah. Yeah? yeah. All right, so it's okay. So. My confession here is as follows. I played it um, uh, during like up building up to 2018. A lot of people walked up to me and said, hey, have you played The Last of Us Part 1? As a writer, I hate that sentence. As a writer, you should really play this game because of the story and the characters. It's a super immersive, great game to play. So end of 2018, I was like done with it. I bought a PlayStation 4. I got God of War. I got The Last of Us. I got some Uncharted games because I was supposed to play all of these games as a writer. I was supposed to like them. So uh, I probably should be already getting this. When I played The Last of Us, I didn't like it. Um, it, it probably a great game, probably a great story. Uh, Naughty Dog, please don't fire me or don't not hire me. Um, but the main thing that I had a lot is that these characters that we were to play with, uh, which is Ellie over here and Joel over there in the corner, uh, and this character, you're not going to play with him. There's also a character somewhere in the corner over there, but you, we don't see him because of the darkness. Um, Ellie is a great character. She is perfectly written. Somebody went out to go to a lot of effort and it was like great motion capture. 
I really believe Ellie whenever she was on stage. I really get her voice acting. Um, you know, and when the writers went into this, they went into a lot of effort by going, okay, we want characters on stage, we want people to believe them, we want the realism to really get across. Um, oh, so sorry. Uh, we're gonna go back here. Thank you so much, wrong button. There's a very tiny pointer button over here. Um, but she has wants and needs, which is usually something that you do when you write your characters. You go like, what does the character want, but what does the character really need? And that, those two kind of conflict with each other. That conflict is something that you, as the audience, really get into when you watch a show or when you play something. Um, but the interesting thing to me was while playing this, that her wants, you know, as a character, she is a young woman. Um, she tries to have a childhood in like a very cruel world because it's a zombie game, so it's supposed to talk. Um, and she wants safety, she wants shelter, she wants to belong somewhere. Um, she really needs family and a purpose, and those like are very important elements that try to collide because she's a little bit played as an orphan in the, in the story. Well, what you do as a player is you, you kill people, you pull a bunch of levers and you climb over stuff. And to me, none of this stuff, like as actions, as me as a player, being this character, really embodying that character, I don't, I don't get the wants and needs. They don't, I, don't, I don't get to like really immerse in that. So what, if, what happens is you got a great game, it looks beautiful, probably plays well if you like that type of game. But you just occasionally put your controller down and you see the characters do their stuff and you as a player then do the shooty bits. From a narrative design perspective, from a story writing perspective for games, this is like a rail shooter, right? You, you guys remember rail shooters? Anybody here is old enough to know what rail shooters are? <laughs> One person old enough to know what rail shooters are. So rail shooters used to be a thing in the early stage of video games um, where uh, you got a first person perspective shooter um, and since there were no controls, because usually these were on arcades, um, there would just be like a, an invisible rail that the character would be on and they would like move across and there would be a moment where like characters would jump out on the screen and you could shoot at them. Um, from story-wise perspective, this is the same thing for me when I play Last of Us because I, all the interesting story elements are already pre-written, it's pre-scripted, I have no influence over it, I just watch it. I'm not engaged and when we write for film, when we write for television, there's this very important se uh, sentence which says, show, don't tell, right? So we don't want text on screen that tells us what's gonna happen, what's happening. When an emotional thing happens, when something happens that really changes the character, we want it to be shown. Because as an audience, we're sitting over there, we're watching this. And by seeing it, we believe in it. But games, on the other hand, uh, what you get is that this is a relatively young medium and most people making games have a background of inspiration that comes from film. Some of them have it with books, some of them have it with D&D, like, you know, just tabletop RPGs. But most of them want to make these great, impressive, triple A type films. And so their reference point is going to be some zombie film, some zombie series with great characters, and they want that in the game part, but then you just do the shooty bits. Where I very much believe that this is a play on show thing. Like when stuff happens on screen that is story technically super important, I don't wanna put the controller down and watch people do it because in that, that's the most important element for me that draws me into the game. And yet it's the one thing that I have no choice over, right? That's such an enormous loss, I feel. Um, quick question from the audience over here and I'm gonna single somebody out. I've got you over here, Matt. Um, could you tell me the difference between a game writer and a narrative designer without looking at your phone and checking the Wikipedia. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, I have no clue. All right, I'm gonna go over to you with uh, Grace, what are, so sorry, what's your name? Joyce. Hi Joyce, uh, do you know, could you perhaps give an indication what's the difference between a game writer and a narrative designer? Well, a game writer, uh, narrative designer, designs the story of the game and game designers designs how you implement the story into a game more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's, that's in the right ballpark. Sounds correct to me. Yeah. Sounds correct? Right. I don't know one more. Um, I've already had you. I'm not going to stop you too much. So I've got a present over here, a TSA link. Uh, I think the game designer focuses more on play style, like how you play the story, while the narrative uh, designer like writes the story. So figuring out what the story is and actually playing the story and how to play it would be the 
publication. All right, I would, I would put the titles in the opposite, but that was exactly where we were supposed to be. So a game writer writes parts of the game. They do the writing bits. Usually when games are made, um, the, the, the game director or like the lead game designer is super inspired and they got a, a story in mind. And like, you know, two thirds into the development, they go like, ooh, this is a lot of work. You just hire somebody to do the writing bits. They then hire a writer who, who is usually a game writer who has experience with writing for games. Um, and then they do the writing bits. Uh, from that came narrative designers. Narrative designers are more on team developers who have game development experience, who know how to game design, you know, how to design interaction for players and use their knowledge of storytelling on how to get players really engaged into the story. So we are looking at a game from what is gonna be the player experience? What do you want to do next? And how are we gonna make that into a compelling story? Experience. Now the word experience there, we're, got, we're slowly developing a better language on this, but story experience is super, super duper valuable here. Because story experience is the thing that you tell afterwards. And most players have had this before, that when you play an impressive game experience, what you're gonna bring back is all the things that you did out of the game. But when we ask you what happened in it, you'll get yeah, some things, explosions, something characters, they're super great. You gotta play the story, but what I really loved about it is the first stuff that I did. And from a narrative design perspective, we want those two things to merge. So when you write characters usually, um, you do the following thing. So you, this is a character matrix over here, that's why I use the title character matrix. Um, you're gonna ask yourself, okay, we got a world populated with a certain story, that story has a goal to it, and that goal of the story, you know, that's usually something that's very important, uh, save the world, or get you know, romantically interested with each other. Um, usually that's how you write books, how you write plays, how you write films. Anybody here go see theater plays still? Ha <laughs> ha, that's enough hands, I wasn't expecting that at all. All right, thank you so much, please support theater. Um, but what we look at is, you know, what uh, for a character, we're gonna like give them some personality. They're gonna have wants and needs. They're gonna have a background story. You probably heard this term before, like a three-dimensional character, fully fleshed out three-dimensional character. Um, the three-dimensional part was all the rage when 3D became a rage thing, you know, back in the 80s. Like, ooh, 3D is a thing now. Um, and that's the reference point because people actually don't use the 3D matrix to create personalities. Um, but it was supposed to say that it has a certain depth to them. They have a background story, they have wants and needs. And what you usually see is that most story characters kind of end up in this like middle half section, which is like, you know, completely one dimensional means that they, they're just there on the background. They don't have a lot of things that they want to say. They're just present. And like very poorly written serial characters also like appear and they only have one thing, which is they, they basically a support character of a main person. Those are one dimensional characters where characters have wants and needs and a backstory, like those are three dimensional fleshed out. Then we also have a level of agency. How much does the character actually want to do in the story? Like you have characters that just, you know, the, usually the story is about a character that doesn't want to do a lot until they're thrown into the story and suddenly they have to like decide and take action. Um, and this is where you will see that some characters are really dynamic, which we'll call in their agency. They have dynamic agency. They, they keep changing themselves over time. Like they have a certain want that they pursue. During the story, they've learned what they actually need in life and then suddenly shifts sort of their agency and how to move in on that. I think Kratos is an interesting character in that regard because obviously like, you know, initially he wants to be God of War. Then, you know, God of War resets itself and they call it God of War, which is super confusing. And at that point, Kratos like really needs to like deal with how to deal with his new family life. Um, no spoilers there, I'm not gonna spoil too much of the game, but basically it's Kratos and Boy, uh, or God of Boy, or Boy of Dad. Um, and with Ellie, like she has a certain need, it does shift a little bit during the game, um, but mostly she, like that, that's definitely out there. With other characters that you have with most video games, what you will see is that, um, like when you just have a generic character that you make, they have no backstory. They could have a name, they could have a, a semi backstory, but the main thing is like they're a player avatar, which is a different concept than a protagonist. These are protagonists and these are player avatars. In MMOs or most other games where you really get to create a character, that's really, really a player avatar, but it doesn't do much than be a vehicle for you as a person to play the story. 
fighting games and uh, eSport games are out there as well. Um, however, they usually have something iconic about them because when you select them, their iconicness tells you already their story. So they have a sense of agency and they have a sense of personality, but it's not too much out there because they have to be generic enough for everybody to still be able to like identify with them. Um, um, this is about usually where we get to do things, but as a player, I ask, so what, what do we do with this? The character's created, they have a backstory, they have wants, they have needs, they're super dynamic, but what does the player really get to do in any of that, right? Um, so as we move along, I'm gonna quickly check and see if we can put some of your favorite characters here on this matrix, because somebody just told you you have to think about your favorite characters, so now I'm gonna quickly test you on that. And, dude, I'm gonna single you out. <laughs> What is your favorite game character? I know it's a difficult question, but like if you have to choose genre-wise well, character. It's one of my favorite games, and I like that Lara Croft probably. Her background changes in every single game, so it's kind of hard to pinpoint, but Lara Croft from Tomb Raider. All right, and when you say Lara Croft, like what is it per se that you feel makes her a great character? Uh, again, it depends on which timeline of Tomb Raider you're following, but what I like about the newer Tomb Raider games is she comes from almost, well, she, of course she has her background, of course she has a background in survival skills, but she comes from nothing. She gets thrown in this situation and she has to deal with a new environment, deal with what's going on, and she's de going, and she's basically surviving. She's, yeah, that is a very, very strong person. She does not give up and she takes what she can get and just moves on with that. Mm. Yeah, so would you, would you say that Lara Croft is like somebody who's very dynamic? in their agency, like they want to achieve a lot of things, they make a lot of choices actively and in the story? It, again, depends on which timeline, but the current Tomb Raider games, I would say yes. She has yeah. a certain goal, because she's this whole thing with her mom that disappeared, and this trinity, and et cetera. She and has all, a certain goal, she has certain goals that she wants to achieve. And all of that personality, right? Yes. Yeah, so she's definitely up here in the right right corner of things. Exactly. That's where you put Lara, the modern iteration. The of modern Lara version of Lara Croft, exactly. like the newest yeah. game, yes. All right. Um, and I'm gonna go a little bit in the back over there. That's always the thing with people sitting in the back. You tend to be ignored. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm seeing you being pointed. <laughs> you were not aware. Hello, what's your name? Uh, Lika. Hello, Lika. Um, nice to meet you. Uh, nice I'm gonna ask you the same generic question over there. Do you have a favorite game character? Um, if I had to say, it would be Baz Montenegro from Far Cry 3. Excellent. All right, and that's a very well, good choice. the newest Far Cry, but I'd guilty. I'm I haven't played that one yet. <laughs> um, yeah, I would definitely say it'd be more to the right top as well because he's, well, he's not like a, a playable character in, in three, obviously. I don't know exactly what happens in the newest one, but uh, for three, it would be, um, I g generally really like him because he's like the evil guy, but you kind of do still relate with him in a way. Like you're not like, oh, he's, he's bad, right? He's, yeah, not that evil as he would seem at the first, yeah. well, in instance. Um, so it's kind of difficult to look at it in this chart, I'd say, but I would definitely say it's more at the right. And if you take into account the newer game, I think he'd be very top right as well. Really, like you feel he also like has a lot of agency, like he chooses his own actions. Well, Bad I guys usually, they're, they oh, start okay. a story usually in control of things, right? Yeah, I do believe that in the newest one, um, I don't know if people have played it or not, but you can also play as him, or at least he's more of a protagonist than uh, a non-player character. So then, yes, he would. All right, very good. And I see a person sitting there over there in the dark. <laughs> you thought you were gonna be ignored. <laughs> hey man, what's your name? Uh, Karan. Hi Karan, nice to meet you. Um, so, uh, could you guess what question I'm going to ask you? <laughs> um, I think, character, I can't remember his name, but the protagonist from Watch Dogs 2. Excellent, very cool. Um, I think he'd fit more around the middle though. Yeah, would you point him right, like he's not super dynamic, he doesn't have that many wants and yeah. needs. Precisely, yeah. Yeah. Um, could you explain to us what the, what, how you get introduced to the character? Within like, the game? Like, uh, did you just pick it, did you select him from a menu screen? No, no, I think it, it starts off and you're, you're just him one time. Okay, so you get like a cinematic in the beginning of the yeah. game. I haven't played Watch Dogs, by the way. 80% of your games haven't. <laughs> so uh, uh, you get a cinematic in the beginning that introduces the character. Like it jumps into, uh, 
I don't, it's been a while since I played it, but I think it jumps into a scenario and then it like introduces the, the concept of the game and then you escape from there and then you move on. All right, and, and do you feel that the actions on the, on the board, on the board, the actions on the, uh, in the game themselves also kind of reflect the way that the character fits in there? Like, you know, does he want to shoot? Does he want to, does he want to do all the action bits of the, the story? Or is he fighting against it? Yeah, like, um, like there's a whole team behind, like behind the main character, I guess. So it does fit in with, with his wants and needs, for example. Okay, excellent. So there's no, what you would call a Ludo narrative dissonance where Ludo means to play, it's, it's old, uh, narrative obviously means the story experience overall, and dissonance means that there's a disconnect between what's happening. Ludo narrative dissonance is something that we really take care of, which is that the stuff that's happening on screen, the stuff that you are playing, it still matters to you as you're playing it. You don't feel while playing, I'm playing a racing game, but the main character wants to do something completely different. That part, that's something I really focus on. But what I notice with this particular type of graph, when you're creating characters, what you're missing is this, and that's why what you're going to see in the future a lot more. And I'd like you to like really take care of that or really, really look into that for the foreseeable future. Is that there's going to be another axis on this type of matrix. Where originally we got agency and personality, what we're going to be asking a lot more is what is the player influence on the character? This part over here, one dimensional, um, but lot, lots of dynamicness, this is where you put your MMO characters, usually. They have no personality, really. You, you make the personality, at best you get to RP it a little bit, you know. But usually that's about as far as it gets. Um, in my experience, there is about Bioware games, there's about Cyberpunk that gets like a little bit into this area that's a little bit up here, where they like do a lot of character writing, and they try to as much create like a what do you call a non-linear story or a story that kind of deviates a little bit as you make choices over time. But to my experience, this part is completely underutilized. And I know for a fact that there are lots of people working at this point trying to make this part because this is what you would call a red ocean. This is from a, strat uh, sorry, from a marketing strategy perspective. This is where you would say there's lots of stuff missing here unless you're one of the nerds and you're playing tabletop role-playing games or live action role playing games, or real life games. Because there, you get to be yourself and you get to role play or choose to role play. But you physically stand within the game world and or in your imagination are part of the game world. Your actions, your choices make all the difference. In video games, this is extremely difficult to achieve because of the technology, because you know the computer has to, or like the programming background has to take into consideration that it could go in any direction. And we do know like with Second Life and similar games, you do have a sense of user generated characters where you're allowed to choose a little bit of a background, but that's difficult, right? Because in movies or in books, the background is something that is superimposed, is told in post afterwards. This is what the character came from, then that's why they want this. From a game, you start the game, usually create character, that's as much as you get. Perhaps you get to choose from a drop down menu what your backstory is, but that's about as far as it gets. So there's a lot of work to be done still for the near future when it comes to game storytelling, particularly character creation, um, that we don't know yet. There's also, next to this being a red ocean, there's also a black box for us because we don't know yet how to do this with the exception of the nerds who play this, who play this, or who played this. And I happen to have some luxury that I've been writing games for this as well. And what we do then, uh, particularly real life games, you have an actor, and the actor is themselves or a little bit dynamic in their ability to interact with players. Actors give players a small goal, like a quest, so to say, and you write for the actor like a small note of framework that they get to be. They, the player, then gets to do what they want to do. They get to role play a situation, or they just get to like solve puzzles as they get along. And we're seeing that there's lots of people who love these real life games because they get to like let go of real life a little bit, get into a game scenario, and some of them really enjoy role-playing a character while doing this. Um, but most people just enjoy the setting and the atmosphere. And this is something where we're gonna see a lot of stuff in the future happening. Um, let's see, what's the time at the moment? Uh, 10 past three, what do we got? I think we have a few more minutes. Yeah. You have a few more minutes? Excellent. Yeah. All right, um, so I'd be very curious 
if anybody can think of a character gameplay experience that they've had in video games, that they can fit onto this matrix where the user-generated element is also a part of it. Can anybody enlighten me on games that I haven't played yet because I've not played a lot of games? Yeah, so I was actually thinking about two games because you have those um, story games which are like called butterfly games. So I was thinking of Until Dawn where you essentially follow a story with a bunch of different characters. I don't know how many, let's just say there are five. And essentially the goal, or not the goal, is to make sure they are all alive at the end. And to do so you have to make different choices. So are you going to help this person, yes or no? Or you have to stand still and if you don't they fall off a cliff or whatever. So I was thinking, would you say that's user generated because of course you make the decision or is it still pre-scripted because they of course wrote those decisions beforehand and you can't do anything outside of that. Um, and I also had a second game called Dishonored. There you play a character and you have the main quest line but there are also optional side quests and if you do those side quests that of course also already says something about your character because you do them or you don't do them. And then when you do the side quests there are also choices you can make for example, kill this person or help them because there's like a witch uh, to not spoil it too much. So are you going to help the witch? Are you going to kill the witch? That kind of things. Hmm. So if I understood correctly, your first uh, comment there was also a question at the same time. Would I, would I consider that pre-scripted? So the interesting thing about that is that all games are pre-scripted because obviously there's a certain set of scripting and all writing games are pre-scripted at the moment because we have to script all the writing elements because writing and or programming and artificial intelligence to write all that, we're not there yet, we'll get there. Meaning that we'll allow for more user generated content. But for me, that is definitely like in the, like in this, this area here where you have pre-scripted multiple options that you can choose from and you allow the player experience themselves to guide which element they're going to go for. Do you play a protagonist there? Do you play, or do you play as the group, as the players? You play as all the players. Yeah. Okay, so do you, so, you would say that as characters, they're pretty 3D, the characters all yeah. have background stories, yeah, and definitely. you get to do a little bit more uh, 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 choosing as well, right? Yes, you do. So essentially, it swaps point of views the whole time, so you face right. each character. And at the same time, we can also go up, because there's lots of agency characters want to achieve things as well. Yeah. yeah. But this is also, welcome to my job, by the way, like all the multiple linear thinking over there. All right, thank you so much. Anybody else really feel like they have a game experience that they feel they can plot out on this in the 3D sense? I got somebody over the front here. Yeah, it's similar to Until Dawn, I would say the Life is Strange series, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is entirely about the story of following one particular character in game one, that's Maxine Caulfield, who was like living her life at this high school and she discovers she has power to tr turn back time. But for this entire game, you're following her story, her relationship with her friends around her and some mystery that you're uncovering at the school. But I think it would make it a little more interesting is the fact that you're only following it through her eyes. So instead of that you're seeing like there's no bird, o bird eye overview, there's no change between characters. No, everything she knows is also what you get to know. So I would say that it is indeed pre-scripted, but there's also a little bit more relation between the player and the character since you're basically her in the entire game. And everything she knows is your knowledge. And everything that, you, that she doesn't know, you also don't know in that very moment. Hmm. You really see it from what she is experiencing. Yeah, and I, I happen to have played this game. <laughs> so I definitely, and I love, the thing that I love about that game is also that um, the actions that you do as the character also fit kind of like, you know, what the character would do. She's at a high school, she's a, she's a photography, you get to make photos at the same time. She is a person who's pretty shy, but she will connect with other people. You get as a player to like connect with somebody as well. So I really love that element because the personality their personal development as well, that is part of the gameplay. And that part I really love, and that's where I love making games myself. Now, uh, there will be lots of questions in the end. Uh, for that, for now, that's me. Um, thank you so much for your time. And, um, A big hand, I would yeah. say. <laughs> But uh, I suggest let's uh, continue uh, with the questions and maybe also uh, for Aris if there are more questions for Aris. Um, but here's a question. If you have a question for Aris, then also say that you have a question for Aris, then he knows that he has to answer it. What is your favorite character in a video game? Oh, now that, you've asked that, that is a very good question. So mm, if I really had to choose right now, 
I know this is not a good example, but it is one of my favorite characters. It's Link, like Mozilla. I grew up, Ocarina of Time kind of shaped me. <laughs> I see fans, thank you so much. Link doesn't have that much personality, um, which for me is great because when I play games, I tend to do a little bit of role playing in my head while playing it. So I get to do a little bit. Obviously, it doesn't have that much dynamic going on. It's good enough. But whenever I see Link, I'm like, yeah, Link. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to hear what Iris's uh, the favorite character is. Um, yeah, I think this is a, an answer that changes, um, you know, depending on a phase of my life. But I think right now I would have said um, Yoshimitsu from Tekken, another fighting game, uh, because uh, <laughs> I see a pattern here. There's something for <laughs> fighting going on. And I can explain. So uh, this character has always been introduced uh, with a mystery around his uh, personality. He, he, he has always been seen uh, under a mask and armor. You never get to see his real face in the like 25 years of uh, Tekken's existence. And uh, he has been labeled from his debut as a space ninja. So uh, there's also been the debate, is he a man? Is he a machine? Because he also has ma a machine parts. So is he a man? Is he a robot? Is he an alien? Is he like everything? So I like this uh, little mystery that is around his character. And what I find very interesting is that uh, all this information about his backstory and uh, his um, motives, his uh, robotic parts or his supposed alien pa parts or everything uh, comes from paratexts from the game. So manuals and uh, um, and uh, art books and what the fans themselves appropriate. So uh, his uh, character that has been given to the fans um, with some specific traits in the game, it doesn't, it's not explored that deeply, but uh, fans get to make their own uh, theories and their own meanings and ideas of uh, this particular mysterious character. All right. Any others? I wanted to ask, uh, like, with the whole movement of games becoming more simulators, with like the metaverses, uh, Roblox, uh, I don't know, VR chats, and I assume in the future it's going to get even more deeper since people are living online basically right now. How much do you think can the pre-written characters survive that, or do you think the future is just um, user avatars, basically, not characters in that sense? That is a very good question, and it's difficult to say because it is a black box, um, but I have a, the following opinion about that. My expectation is that writing, written characters will always exist because they have a very strong element. A pre-written character has a certain personality to them that allows people to reflect themselves onto that character or from that character. A character with a very strong determination when you encounter them, you ask yourself, do I agree with that character or not? Um, it doesn't say that I don't expect that user-generated uh, characters are going to fill that in a lot. But the issue with that is once you have like a room full of people that don't really have a particular direction where they're going story-wise, it is unlikely that you'll get like a very gripping story experience out of it. You'll probably get something like a memorable experience out of it. You'll occasionally get story experiences out of it, but you'll always need to put something of a drop in there that gives it a direction. And that's where you get pre-written characters and or AI scripted characters that are given something like a hint. Okay, we want this group of characters to go into that direction. We're gonna pick a character. They're gonna be a little bit combative and they're gonna to try to challenge the group into you know, having an opinion about something and develop it over time. My expectation is that's definitely where we're gonna to head to. Other than that, LPs and audio tapes are back, so I kind of expect that people will eventually go back into retrowave and go like, oh man, remember those pre-written characters? Wasn't that great? Those were way more stable and, and understandable. I definitely expect that that's going to be like a, say, a, a, uh, a retro game type uh, remake wave that we'll get in the future as well. Any more questions or remarks? I, yeah, well, I had I had one question. You say you you uh, you say it's a it's a red ocean. It's a sea of opportunities. But I was also, but maybe you already answered it. I was going to ask: Isn't it also just a matter of preference? Because I know, for example, my cousin he doesn't like to play these mass open world sandbox uh, gazillion side quests, uh, creating your own character kind of games. He just wants to play the more well link type games where you get dropped into a story and the characters don't necessarily have too much depth and. You follow the story that these artists have thought up. I mean, 
it, it's also a matter of preference, I would say, right? It is absolutely a matter of preference. There is one thing outside of matter of preference that drives game development, which is money. Um, most games are made with an idea in mind that they will get a certain money, a certain amount of money back from sales. And from that perspective, hype is going to be a big thing. Right now, big open world games with lots of like hyper-realistic art graphics and like really detailed screenwriter type characters are a thing because we have this once like the technology, the people from the technology side want to do that. On the other hand, there's people with money, usually not game developers themselves, usually the pre-investors. They don't have that much, not, they don't play games that much. And the thing that they know are movies. So they know nice visuals and nice characters because that's what they know as a reference point. And so you will still see that there's like an element that says, okay, we'll do what the people with the money want. And NFTs are a thing now, so people are jumping on the NFT bandwagon because that's what usually the board members want. And we will eventually see that you know, at some point AI is, is already becoming a massive hype. The metaverse is becoming a, ma a massive hype. And you will eventually get more people with money to go like, hey, do we have one of those uh, pre-scripted AI character thingies? I've, I've heard they make a lot of money. So you will eventually see that push. I do expect that to happen, definitely. So um, I'm relatively old as well uh, in this room. Um, <laughs> in this room, yes. <laughs> uh, and some of my favorite uh, RPGs are uh, Final Fantasy VII uh, with Cloud, which is my favorite uh, uh, like character, but also Fallout 2 and Baldur's mm -hmm. Gate 2, which are both very much open world uh, type games. Uh, but one of the things I always uh, wondered is, how much more difficult is it to make an open world game as compared to making uh, a game like Final Fantasy VII? Because I always imagined that you can build the entire game around that one narrative, that one character, and you can f put all your resources behind it. And Fallout 2 has great repl replayability, but it does mean you have to uh, build for every possible pathway that you can take. So in terms of resources, uh, does that also play into, uh, into this? Absolutely, yes. Um, so your question is going to be like, is, is, is what's the difficult difference between creating a linear type game, so the game is like a straightforward experience, and a non-linear type game that has an open world aspect to them? Um, it, it grows about four to 10 times more difficult to make them because in a linear style game, we know what's going to happen since we only have one story go moment going forward. There will be some side quests here and there, but we have very clear points very clear endings of so-called scenes. And we say, okay, this is now, uh, the main character solves a certain point of the story and it can progress onwards. Th you do that as well with uh, open world games because you wanna have the feeling of a story progressing. But I, am, for example, somebody who, while playing The Witcher 3, um, have hardly played the main story. I've done most of the side quests. I'm way too high of a level right now for the main story, so to say. Um, uh, and I don't care, I honestly don't care. Um, but it, I know that there's people out there trying to push me to really play the main story element. And they've also done that from the design perspective because at a certain point, the amount of things you get to do runs out. And they go like, oh yeah, that was a, a main story I need to go to. Um, I'm currently working on, a, on an MMO and I'll tell you, man, that's difficult. Because you're going to have to assume that there's people going to play a main story of it but you're also going to assume that people are just gonna log in and just wanna do their daily grind stuff and like they'll get bits and pieces of it, but you're going to have to facilitate everybody. So it really looks like that, um, the difference between this and this basically, when it comes to creating open worlds, because you have an enormous dimension that you have to take care of while writing, which usually means you have to write 10 times as much as you would otherwise would. Which is that you're actually writing like, well, in linear story, you're like writing one game, but in, what you say, like writing multiple games to a certain degree? Yeah. 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 Hmm. yeah. Hmm. Or at least multiple stories. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, uh, one more question. Yeah, um, I was wondering what you think about those like TV show spin offs, like you saw Jinx on uh, screen, and obviously Arcane has been very popular, and there was also like World of Warcraft movies and stuff. Do you think that's a tool that's going to be used more to give uh, characters more of a background story if it's not possible in game, or what do you think? What role does that play? Woof, that's 
it is not set as far as I've seen. So, for example, World of Warcraft, the movie, and uh, Arcane, the television series, both have different functions. Obviously, with Arcane, uh, the game developers had the opportunity with the wealth that they've had to do something that they wanted to do. But the community has asking for so long, what's the backstory of these characters? So they went like, we'll do that. Outside of making a comic book series, we're gonna make a series as well. So for them, that was their purpose. With the World of Warcraft movie, that was a part that the team also wanted to achieve, but it is definitely also the money part, which is hopefully will break into a new area of storytelling, um, which from my perspective didn't succeed as much. Um, it's going to be very dynamic. So what you used to have is that in the past when you created a movie, a big blockbuster movie, say Pirates of the Caribbean, you just have like a video game spin-off and like, you know, something like a comic book spin-off on the side as well. I'm expecting that that's definitely a lot more the future as well with video games. You get spin-offs that do a little bit of extra, but they take into consideration that it's a different audience that they're writing for. And so they will also be telling a different type of story as well, considering who the audience is. So I'm really expecting that's really the function, so to say, of yeah. all these spin-off style media uh, creation. I, I have one, one more question, like maybe to also like combine the two talks a bit, because you say the red ocean, uh, yeah. Right, that's, that's what we're uh, talking yeah. about. How much can, for example, like your conception of fandom, how much can that add to, I don't know, exploring this ocean, so to speak? Like, do, do, can fandom um, uh, open this or um, uh, help to close this gap, in your opinion? Yes, absolutely. Yeah? Certainly, yes. And uh, yeah, fandom can also explore things that are even beyond the red ocean and uh, give uh, their own appropriations, meanings, understandings, as I said earlier. Uh, but uh, the thing is how much of it is official, and some fans actually care about making that part official, part of the canon. Some others don't really care, and they just want to create their own version of the story and put it up there. So it also depends on you as a fan, what are you trying to accomplish? Because if you're trying to convince a company to make something canon, then that takes a lot of work, and most of the times it doesn't work. <laughs> Um, but perhaps time for one or two more questions and then, yes? Considering we're talking about spin-offs and how often TV shows, book, comic book series game, uh, already exist, tabletop games get converted into video games, what would you consider harder like writing narrative-wise? Basing something on already existing source material, which means you have to be very, very close and like very na uh, narrow with all the details that everything is right with already existing story or creating a whole new story out of basically nothing. What would be harder in that sense? Oof. So um, from my personal experience, um, using existing media is good because you don't have to do all the, what we call world building, which is you don't have to think out all the logics of the world where the story is gonna take place. And you know you have a sense of audience that you can write for, so that is easier to write for because of that. It has a very difficult element, which is if you're not familiar with that, like for example, the director says, we wanna make a, a game about this particular book. And then I have to go like, oh, but then I have to read the book and get into the fandom and understand the logic of it. Um, as a writer, you may not be properly adjusted to what the expectation of the audience or the fan base is gonna be. I'm gonna be very honest with you. Um, I was hoping, uh, and I'm still hoping that this will happen, that cyberpunk um, would break this as well. What we've seen with movies is that when a movie is being made, 90% um, of the time, maybe 95% of the time, it's based on a pre-existing media. Because writing the film based on pre-existing media has the following things. You know there's gonna be fan base, there's gonna be people showing up. You know the story works because you can read it from beginning to end. And you also know kind of what the story experience is supposed to be. And so picking that up and turning that into a movie is great. You have to project from a director perspective what the, the action of the movie experience is gonna be. And I was hoping that with Cyberpunk, uh, and I'm still hoping that, that we have a similar thing, which are tabletop RPGs. They usually have backstory, lore, and gameplay enhanced, they put into it. That means that for game writers, what I really hope that we'll get into a lot more is that a lot more, because there's so many tabletop RPGs being made and being published at the moment, that we have a large arsenal of tabletop RPGs that have lore and characters and everything, but also the dynamicness of player agency within it. Um, so I'm really hoping that that's gonna be the future uh, of writing for games. Right. Last question, I think. Yeah, how, how do you prevent the player from getting such feelings like, hey, 
this is only happening right now because the writer wanted this to happen or because uh, the, the, the game designer wanted me to like now enter this kind of gameplay, therefore the story is like making it happen. So, yeah. That is, uh, I hope that you're after a talk available because that's a very long conversation to have. Um, it is a tricky scenario because as a writer, you always have an end goal in mind of the story, and that's what you're writing towards to. And there are occasions where you eventually go like, okay, this is going too much off a tangent. We want to bring people back to the main story. Honestly, at that point, that's bad writing. If you've gone off on a tangent too much and you have to really reel people in, uh, in, in to create a scenario where people go like, ah, okay, everyone's having fun, but now I have to do the main story part again because the writer wants me to. I'm assuming that's kind of what you mean, right? Do you have an example that I could use? If I use a very ridiculous example, like, you know, you're just like in the game, in the story, and suddenly, like, enemies, like, assault you, and, like, <laughs> do stuff because they wanted you to, to fight now. Uh, or, like, it, it can be the other way around as well. It's, yeah, I, I think it's, it's the most clear way. Yeah, so there is that sort of like structural logic, the ludonarrative experience element, wherein from a, 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 a talented or like an experienced narrative designer will be able to avoid these type of scenarios from happening because they'll be creating space for experience boundaries by saying, okay, this is about what we want the players to experience and these are the type of activities that fit within that. Or ergo, these are also the type of story experiences, action, romance, you, you name it. Um, if, for example, you feel that you want to be explorative, but the main game says, hey, we wrote all this action stuff, all the fighting, we want you to do the fighting bit, then that's what you call ludonarrative dissonance, where suddenly your player experience is being completely like interrupted. Writing that requires that sort of like narrative design perspective. And in order to avoid that from happening, you have to like pre-plan that by saying, okay, this space has the following actions that we want to focus on, you know, like the action parts or the shooting parts, and this space we're gonna move on next word. That's a different focus as well. And a lot more modern games, I feel, are getting into that area. There's still mistakes being made or accidents happening because budgets, time constraints, games are big, so people may forget occasionally to properly play through the area. And this is also the place where uh, Q&A shines. That's where these people are extremely valuable to play through the game a couple of times and see, hey, pacing-wise, it doesn't work as well. So the feedback from that is also extremely valuable and important as well. All right, well, the very, <laughs> very last question. And then afterwards, there's of course room for more questions, but then it's more like one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I'm really sorry. It's just because I think your perspective on The Last of Us is really interesting because I was always someone who was really hyped just because I love the story. Um, but what would you think about the second game then? Would you say there are certain developments or would you say it's more or less like the first game? Where would you put it onto your scale? <laughs> right, you're gonna be pretty happy with my answer because my answer is I haven't played it. <laughs> 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 I'm so sorry, so I have no idea what that's gonna well, be. Well, maybe you can tell him what you think of that afterwards. I don't know. Or is somebody else who's played The Last of Us 2. I haven't played it. Iris, have you played it? No? Well, then we can help you out. But maybe, maybe somebody else. Um, I would like to, uh, to leave it at that for now. Uh, thank you so much, Rudolf. Thank you so much, Aris. Yes, please, a big hand for Aris as well. Thank you, Aris. Thanks to uh, both of our speakers, I would say. Uh, thanks to uh, Studium Generale for organizing this, of course. Thanks to the Esports Association link. Uh, thank you all for coming. And hopefully till, the, till next time. That's going to be next year, I think, right? See you in a year. Thank you.